Yes, thank you. Uh, Baptiste Genet from uh, University Paris Dauphine. Uh, just a question. Do you know why migrants send remittances to their na native village? I mean, the, do, do they intend to, re to, to, to go back to their village after retirement or things like that? Or is it something like an investment within households, you know? You send somebody and after a while you are waiting for an amount of money. Something like a development strategy program, private one, I mean, uh, within households and so on. So do you have any information about migrants? Why they send money to their, uh, their native village and so on? Okay, other question? Yes? Um. Thank you. A very quick question, partly related to the previous one. Uh, why do you emphasize the need to uh, analyze the impact on communities and not households? Uh, uh, I think both are important. An important question is is uh, the possibility that that remittances uh, increase di uh, say say increase inequality within a community. But thank you for an interesting paper. Yeah. In the back, there, yeah. There was another one. I did not see. No, no. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. okay. Yes, thanks for an interesting paper. Um, one of the things you didn't mention, which um, is quite common in in Zimbabwe, is whether there's a two-way flow um, in remittances. Um, does the household invest? in establishing a migrant either in Bulawayo or South Africa by sending support to this member in order that the member may uh, return remittances at a later date. Um, are there differences in patterns uh, between whether the migrant is working in, in Zimbabwe or in South Africa? Or do, are the pat patterns of remittances pretty much the same in either case? I'm thinking particularly of the the ease or difficulty in remitting, say, bags of cement, um, building materials versus cash. Um, one of the things you didn't mention, I don't know if it was operational at the time you did your field work, is the effects of eco-cash, um, electronic, uh, telephonic transfers of cash, the Zimbabwe's equivalent of, of M-Pesa in Kenya. Um, and then finally, just just to add to some of your findings, um, in my work I find very much the same thing. There is clearly um, a pattern of intentional retirement in rural areas. If you if you ask preferences um, of individual migrants, they they will tell you that uh, when when they finish their productive careers, wherever they may be, that they intend to return to their rural homes. Um, at some stage in the future. Okay, um, I'm Yong Fu Fang from UNU Wider. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I think it is sensible that uh, remittance will contribute to consumption investment and local development. If we often um, people talk about inflation in Zimbabwe, uh, in other issues. I wonder if you could talk about the potential negative impact of remittance for the local economy, um, for <clears throat> inflation, for exchange rate, right? for local labor markets. Thank you. Okay, I think you could answer. I'll pass the microphone to you. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting questions. The first one I have here is why those people send remittances back to their communities. Basically, um, most of those immigrants who move from this particular study area, which is village two in Cholocho to South Africa, they don't completely cut ties with their families. But you would find that it's possibly a father for that particular family who's moving to South Africa. And they have the whole responsibility of making sure that the wife and the children are well kept. So they send back their remittances for the general upkeep of their families. And um, 
over and above the, 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 the need for investment for them. The primary reason why they sent the remittances back is for the well-being of their families, so that their children could go to school, so that their wives could be able to buy what they need on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, the second one is why on communities and not households? Um, we realized that over time, most of the studies that had been done on remittances, particularly in Zimbabwe, the main focus was on households and the, the outcome generally was dismissing remittances as only consumptive and not much in terms of investment. So we tried to go a little bit further and find out Will there be any impact beyond consumption on the local level that uh, remittances could be having in terms of promoting local development? So I, I think that was more or less one of the driving factors as to why we chose to focus on the local economy and not the household. A quick follow-up then, if, if, if I may. But your findings do confirm the same thing. I mean, it's mostly consumption. It is consumption. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think these are poor people that it's the primary needs, right? So you don't... It is consumption, I would agree. That is at the household level. But if you look further beyond the household, you'll find that remittances have an attractive, or, or rather an attracting effect on people who come to then invest in this particular community. So they promote what we then call productive consumption. Yeah. It's not necessarily a bad that people consume. <laughs> yes, yes. At the household level, they do consume them, but their consumption is productive in that it attracts investment from people who are themselves not basically receivers of remittances. I think this is, this is critical. If I may just add to this, mm -hmm. uh, basically, what you're describing is a first knock-on effect. But what I, found, what I found interesting is the type of activities you're describing is sort of a lot of trading and then construction. So at least you get a house, you, that's another consumption, good if you wish, but it's durable, so they do it durable. But what I was interested in is like, how much does it then help to generate a local engine of growth? Well, the moment the remittances drop, does the whole thing drop as well, apart from the houses which are in much better shape now? So I didn't like if there is a lot of investment in productivity in agriculture or like a little manufacturing, something else which then can take over based on the investment they have gotten from. And I, did you see some of that as well? Um, we didn't quite dig deeper into that, but as my recommendation, one of my recommendations, we were keen on going to find out the sustainability of this investment ventures to see if in the event that remittances will stop flowing into this community, will this going to remain sustainable and keep going or that will be the crumble of everything. So we want to see if there is any solid base on which these are, are built on so that if the remittances stop flowing in, then they could be continued um, economic activity in this particular community. Um, the other question I had was uh, whether there is a two-way kind of remittance flows to say, are there any remittances flowing from the people from Zimbabwe, the families, to the immigrants who are now in, in South Africa? Basically, um, I think of note is the fact that most of the immigrants are not based in Zimbabwe. They are all in South Africa. The only contribution of the family probably will be to bring up the money that they'll use for on their first move to move from Zimbabwe to South Africa. And then from there, there is no continued uh, support from the family side to the emigrant. But rather, there is a whole lot of remitting from the emigrant from South Africa to the family back in Zimbabwe. And this was mainly uh, exacerbated around 2000, between 2000 and 2008, the, the climax of it being 2008 when the economy completely crashed and everyone was moving out of Zimbabwe. So there was no internal migration as it were. Many people were moving out of Zimbabwe to South Africa, Botswana, some going as far as Europe, the United Kingdom being the popular destination for most of theirs. So in terms of dual kind of remittances, there was not 
there is nothing really in, except the contribution of the monies that they will use to move initially from their home areas to South Africa. And um, the eco-cash aspect of it. By the time we, we did the study, eco-cash was not yet functional. But another factor as well to consider is that eco-cash is just local for now. Um, it was not as international when we, 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 we did the, the, the field work. So it's mainly a, a tool for cash transfer within Zimbabwe and not uh, internationally or interregional. And then the ne uh, potential negative impact of, of, of remittances on inflation. I think this one I won't be able to say for now, specifically after the introduction of the multi-currency system, because uh, from 2009 to date, we stopped using our own currency, the Zimbabwean dollar. We are now using the United States dollar, the South African rand, and sometimes the Botswana pula. So in terms of really remittances contributing to inflation, there is very little, if ever, there is any change in terms of inflation from the time that we did our study to date. So I won't be in any position to really comment on whether the remittances are causing any inflation in any way. Thank you. Okay, so thanks to the three presenters for a very interesting uh, session. And Oh, there was. Oh, I'm sorry, but I, I, I think we're going to close the okay. session. Or oh, perhaps you could ask her. Uh, at, okay. Okay. So it's time for lunch. Mm -hmm.